planted this church here in uh, here in Portland. Um, I wanted to do want to introduce my wife Fran, who is the. Uh, how many of you have heard of Yes Magazine? <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> Fran, as you probably know, is the publisher, and she's going to hand out, go around with a sign-up sheet if you're not on the Yes newsletter and also on my newsletter. Um, so with that in detail out of the way. Um, yeah, it's been quite some time since I've been to this church. How many of you are members of this church or participants in this church? Okay. And how many of you are here for the UUGA, delegates and others? Okay. Is there anybody here who's not a UU? Okay. I go in that category too. I'm unaffiliated, but I have a deep affinity for UUs, including for my wife who's a UU, so we're all, we're all family. Um, The UU theme for this General Assembly is building a new way. About five, six thousand people here engaged in conversations about turning the human course. The theme I'm going to speak about connects particularly to the UU seventh principle. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now, I suspect we all resonate to that frame quite naturally. Um, and as I will elaborate, I think that is part of our nature as human beings. That is who we are. We are part of the web of life. But we have forgotten. Um, we need to recover the story. We need to reclaim it in a far deeper way than most of us have been prone to do within modern society. And so I'm hoping that this will uh, presentation will help us uh, with that connection. Um, certainly that is the, the primary theme of change the story, change the future. A living economy for a living earth. Uh, it's always particularly exciting for me to come to Portland. I grew up in Longview, Washington, as some of you know. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty much home for me. Uh, we came up here, came down here from time to time to visit the big city. Uh, and of course now Portlandia uh, is building the model for the cities of the future and building a city not, not as the high-tech glass and steel wonder with uh, drones buzzing around, but for a real community deeply embedded in nature and place. And that is, must, be our, uh, must be our journey. So, I come out of a business school background, um, and one of the positive things I learned in business school, a very helpful thing, is look at the big picture. If you identify a problem, you may have, you know, you've got to solve the problem, but most of the problems that draw our attention are symptoms of some kind of system failure. Now, you know, we're going to focus on that within within a business, particularly a big corporation, and you know, that's what I taught at the Harvard Business School. Um, but as many of you know, I, I, I know so many of you, we're familiar, we have related together, we've been together at previous presentations, and I know many of you read my books. Um, so you probably mostly know that Fran and I spent the majority of our adult professional lives uh, working in international development, working overseas, and it is the experience of the economic processes playing out all around the world, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the, country, the areas that uh, we have committed ourselves to in developing. Um, seeing that play out in terms of the devastation of people's lives and the environment and culture and so forth is very much what, what drew me to this uh, inquiry. And always within this large frame of, okay, if things are going so badly wrong, what are the systemic causes? Because if we try to solve the problem without a systemic framework and analysis, we will treat symptoms and we will never solve the problem. We may alleviate systems, we may symptoms, we may help a few poor people, we may save a few trees or endangered species, but in the end we lose unless we address the system that is creating the problem. 
Um, so I'm going to take you through a little journey, big picture journey. We'll touch on the current human crisis, but I assume you're all here because you're well aware that we're in deep trouble. So I'm, I'm not going to attempt to depress you further if you're not already badly depressed. Uh, you're, you're not paying attention. <laughs> but then I'm going to, as Mel was talking about, I've come to realize the importance of our story frames, that they're foundational to how we think about problems, how we think about our relationships to each other and to creation. Uh, and I'm going to take, I'm going to look at the, the story that has got us trapped uh, currently, and I'm going to take a leap up to the cosmic level, to the level of the dynamics, the forces, the nature of creation itself, uh, which is the deepest story essential to our understanding. Um, and then I'm going to bring it down to a living earth and all the way to a living economy. And the defining frame is a very simple truth that I suspect you'll all immediately recognize, but you hardly ever hear it spoken. We are living beings born of and nurtured by a living earth, itself born of a living universe. And that changes everything. So, one of the things that's special about this moment, as, as Mel mentioned, is a sense of awakening to the imperative for deep change. Now, many of us have been aware of that for quite some time. It is not news. But there is always a process in terms of deep change in society. If a few people begin to get it, and they begin to spread the word, and you're just shouting and beating and so forth, and you don't seem to make any progress, but the word is spreading, the awareness is spreading, and then we have these breakthrough moments of possibility. And I sense we are very much coming to a breakthrough moment of possibility, uh, creating the possibility for their deep, very deep change. And I just want to note three critical framing points of awareness that set the context for our time. First, the Occupy movement and the contribution it made to raising broad awareness of inequality, extreme inequality, as a problem of our time. Foundation. Then we've been going through this remarkable awakening uh, as a consequence of police shootings black men and the frame of Black Lives Matter. Now, of course, at the deeper level, what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a general public awareness of what many of us have been seeing for a long time is the extreme injustice of our justice system. And the fact that in the United States we have a higher proportion of people in prison than any other country in the world and we consider this the, the land of freedom and democracy. And of course they're all they're disproportionately black and other and people of color. And one of the things we're waking up to more generally as a society is that unless justice is secure for all of us, it is not secure for any of us. That creates a new sense of solidarity. Then we have this remarkable Pope Francis. Are we all thinking of converting to Catholicism? <laughs> um, I mean, this is an extraordinary document, as you know, and it is calling us to rethink our nature at the very deepest level. And it is also calling out capitalism and the an unjust, inherently unjust and destructive economic system. Um, I, I particularly love the, uh, the homily that Pope Francis put out a bit ago on the idolatry of money. A very simple frame, money itself is not evil. It is the worship of money as a false god that is evil. And that so nails it in terms of the frame that I'm going to be discussing. We are literally a society of money worshippers, and it is very much our own doing. Then we have this very recent development, which David spoke about with the TPP.
this shocking, stunning development of President Obama joining an alliance with the corporate right, with the Republicans who sought to destroy him and in an alliance to push through an agreement that in its every provision, as far as we know, is contrary to the interests of people and nature, and it's basically about strengthening the rights, privileges, and power of global corporations that know no allegiance to any country, place, or person. Uh, now, it's very depressing, but it's also a very awakening moment. And it sets the stage for a deep and powerful political realignment. Uh, I just published a, an article on this about the, you know, the, the depth of what's involved, but also the possibility on the Yes website go to yesmagazine.org. Uh, it's getting a lot of attention and spreading very rapidly. Uh, and it's just highlighting the obvious. Uh, we now have a very clear picture of the political alignments in the United States. It's not about big government versus small government. It is about corporate rule versus democracy. so complex, so far beyond our human understanding that we cannot possibly, at least in our current state of development, understand its real nature. So we have to live by stories that are approximations of reality. And there are many different stories. And of course, one of the values of the UU, and it tends to be a progressive value, is that, well, you know, we need to honor everyone's story which in a sense we do, but at another level, 
Some stories, in fact, are more close, correspond more closely to reality than others. They are not, in fact, all equal. Now, part of what's distinctive about you use is the search, the question, the asking. Asking the questions, not just taking received wisdom. And this is a challenge of our time, is to draw from all the sources of human understanding and knowledge to evolve our story to a deeper and deeper understanding that is necessary to get ourselves out of our, our current dilemma. Um, and one of the things I try to do is boil this down to the simplest possible elements. And of all, you know, all the things I'm going to tell you tonight or that you're going to read in my books, they're all things that you know. Indeed, they are things that I believe we are born in because the deepest, you know, the deepest knowledge, the idea of Earth as our living mother, comes out of indigenous wisdoms. It's the earliest human story, and it is the starting point. But we are continuously told, taught, in our educational systems, in the corporate media, um, we're taught simplistic stories that capture only a part of the reality and that actually present a block to recognizing our true nature. So we come down to two key variables. What is most important? What is most sacred? What is most essential to our well-being, to our existence? Money or life? Money or life? And how do we best organize to govern ourselves, to organize ourselves? Corporate rule or democracy? So there's two basic variables. Money or life is our defining value, the criteria by which we measure progress, measure our success. And are we best ruled by global corporations that are accountable only to financial markets? Or do we best rule ourselves as democracies? Organized around nations of people who have, to whom our national governments are truly accountable and that work in the service of people and communities. Those are the two challenges, because of course, we are currently in a society that, as we discussed before, values life only for its market price and its financial value. And we're in a society increasingly ruled by corporations with our national governments and our, our politicians answering not to the people who elect them, but to the corporations that finance them. Now, the system under which we live, I actually characterize it in the, uh, the new edition of A Corporation to Rule the World as a robotic system. By which I mean it is a system that operates on autopilot. Ultimately, it's controlled by financial markets that are largely computerized. Now, we see the financiers and we see the corporate CEOs and we think they're in charge of the system. We far better understand what's going on if we recognize that they are but well compensated servants of a system that they do not control. And they are powerless to change in a positive direction. That has deep implications because it means the impetus for change has to come from those of us outside the system or those who are within who are prepared to help weaken it and sabotage it. Now, when you get a system that measures its purpose and its performance, its progress, by the accumulation of financial assets, and you have a system governed by an economics that says we make our decision, best make our decisions 
by evaluating every choice on the basis of which will produce the highest return for money.
that it doesn't make any difference how much money we can make from the destruction of nature. That is not wealth creation. That is destruction of the foundations of our existence. So one of the, one of the participants in this uh, gathering um, was Karma Sakin, who is the head of the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Commission. I'm sure you've all heard of the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Indicators. Uh, he gave us a very nice presentation about what they're doing and the, uh, the framing behind it and so forth. And he ended with three words. Time is life. Time is life. I was stunned. Why was I stunned? My daddy taught me time is money. He was a business man. If you've been to business school, you know for almost everything you're doing, your financial calculations, the basis of everything is the time value of money. Time is money. So you think about it. If we live by the story, time is money, how does that differ from if we live by the story, time is life? Did you have a good day today? Did you make a killing? Or did you make a living? You think about living in the broadest sense, not just but living. That establishes the foundational frame that we're dealing with here, of moving from a time as money world to a time as life world. Now, here's the story we're caught up in. I call it the sacred money and market story. These are the elements. Time is money. Money is wealth. Making money creates wealth. And making money, creating wealth, is a defining purpose of people, business, and the economy. Maximizing returns to money maximizes the wealth and prosperity of all. You ever heard of this? <laughs> the rich are society's wealth creators. Affluent lifestyles are their fair and just reward. Material consumption drives prosperity and is the path to happiness. Paying attention? Poverty is a consequence of laziness. The earth belongs to us. It is our human nature to be individualistic, competitive, and inquisitive. And guided by the invisible hand of the free market, these beneficial traits unleash the creative power of humanity to grow the economy and create wealth and poverty and drive the technological innovation required to eliminate our human dependence on nature. The community interest, there is no community, there is no society. The community interest is simply an aggregation of the individual private interests of its individual members. We therefore all do best when we each focus on maximizing our own individual private financial return. In corporations, they're groups of people working together to the cause of freedom, democracy, and mutual prosperity. They're entitled to free treatment and the same rights as any person. So how many elements of that statement are accurate? <laughs> Did anyone detect any statement there that was accurate? So we have the question, why, why do we accept this story? Of course, part of it is that we don't hear any other story in public. And so I may hear that story, and it doesn't make any sense to me, but everybody else seems to accept it, so maybe I'm just stupid or maybe I'm crazy or something. Uh, so part, you know, part of our challenge is, is challenging the story and coming up with an alternative. Now, another reason goes to this issue of our cosmologies, our deepest beliefs about the nature of reality. And I'm just going to run through this very quickly because uh, we, need, we need to be going to the, uh, getting to the, to the Q&A and a little interaction. Um, I talk about in both, in both of these books, the three familiar, uh, the, 
three cosmologies, basic creation stories uh, familiar to most of us in the West. The first story is the distant patriarch. The second story is the grand machine. And the third story is the mystical unity. Now, by the distant patriarch story, all being, all knowing, all agency resides with the patriarch who lives apart in heaven. My most important relationship is to him. The meaning of my life is to figure out what he wants and conform to that to get on his good side to get a good place in the afterlife. So agency, relationship, and meaning. The distant patriarch, I mean the, the grand machine, which is associated with science, is a story in the Newtonian form of the giant clock winding down as the spring unwinds. All as a consequence of mechanism and then a more modern modifications, mechanism and chance. It's all basically deterministic. There is no agency. Everything is related, but it's like the gears in a clock grinding out against each other. And there is no meaning. There's no purpose. Wow. I'm here alone in a meaningless universe with no purpose. Consciousness is just an illusion. Life itself is nothing more than an accidental outcome of the complexity. Wow, that's that's kind of depressing. I think I'll go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a mystical unity story that everything is one. That what we experience as material reality is an illusion born of the ego, and that is the cause of our suffering. Because the ego is the cause of our separation, which is the, the source of, of violence and, and pain. So the answer is deep meditation to transcend, to get rid of, let go of the ego, and meld into the oneness. Now it's interesting to me that none of those um, none of those cosmologies, as described in its most familiar version, gives us any particular reason to care for Earth or to make things work here in a creative way. Now, what's emerging is a new cosmology that draws elements of truth from many, many sources, including these three cosmologies. It starts with a recognition from the stories of science that the actual unfolding of creation bears no resemblance whatever to a clock winding down. To the contrary, the arrow of creation is toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility. Oh, that begins to get interesting. What I'm seeing emerging is a story that begins with some form of spirit, unitary consciousness, awareness, the deep mystery beyond our understanding. But I think of it, you know, this is maybe anthropomorphizing, but we are, I believe, manifestations of that spirit. We, we ourselves are characterized by our drive to know, to become, to create, to evolve in community toward ever greater beauty, awareness, and possibility. So I'm thinking that at some deep level, the spirit in a drive to know itself and its possibilities, birth forth in something that looked like the scientist's great energy cloud. But of course, that cloud was in a constant process of these energy particles joining together to form more complex particles 
atoms, more complex atoms, and molecules, and ultimately into stars, and star systems, and galaxies. And along the way, one of the suns had a planet that began to evolve this carbon-based life. And it started out with the simplest of organisms, single-cell organisms. And these organisms somehow organized into a global community and working with the geological processes of Earth through processes that we have the barest understanding, but we know it, it, it somehow happens. Fundamentally transformed the conditions on the surface of this particular planet in ways we have so far not discovered on any other planet, creating the conditions for more complex and higher form, more aware forms of life to emerge. And part of what they did was they captured excess toxins and carbons out of the atmosphere and sequestered them deep under Earth. Okay, so these simple cells became more complex cells, and then they began to form into multi-cell uh, organisms. And then these organisms continued to evolve, and we had different forms of plants and animal life and so forth, and ultimately, the emergence of a species called human. Now it's interesting to think about our human body. I was made aware of this just about 15 years ago when I met a, uh, I met a little Asian microbiologist, Dr. Mei Wan Ho, um, a chance meeting and told me about her study. She says a conventional biologist to study life will take a cell and grind it up and study its chemical composition and think they should learn something about life. She says, I study living cells as living cells. And I study the ways in which they manage nutrients, energy, information, water, in order to maintain their own living conditions. And then I study how these cells exchange energy, information, nutrition, water, to create and maintain larger organisms. All the while, each of these communities of life creating the conditions essential to a higher form of life. Well, that's kind of interesting. So then you think about our individual bodies, each of our bodies, everyone in this room. Our bodies are comprised of tens of trillions of individual cells, and that doesn't even include all the tens of trillions of biomes that we're being about that are also part of our natural processes. All of these cells self-organizing by, again, processes that we have only the barest understanding of to create a being far beyond the capacities of any of the individuals. Now you begin to think of that as a true miracle of life, of life's capacity to self-organize to a purpose, on a trajectory, you begin to really understand the extraordinary miracle of our existence and a sense of the extraordinary trajectory of creation and recognition that every being in creation is a contributor to that process. You know, some are rogues. We have, we have cancer cells. We have invasive species. And we have some that, uh, that don't do too well. Um, usually they end up destroying themselves by destroying their, their host. And of course, we're acting like cancer cells and invasive species. But we have the potential, if we get our stories right, to become a positive species, to contribute to the unfolding of the whole. Now, one of the tragedies of our time is that we have no institutional spaces currently for examining at the deepest level our stories. Mostly our churches teach dogma as taught in some ancient long dead text. Science is locked into this mechanistic story just beginning barely to admit that maybe there may be something called consciousness. Maybe there is some intention somewhere in creation. Um, but just waking up to that possibility. So even our academic institutions, which are all divided up into silos, 
fragmenting knowledge in ways that make it virtually impossible to understand the deeper nature and meaning of reality. We have got to break through this. We, need, we absolutely must begin creating institutional spaces for the exploration, re-examination, the maturing of our stories, growing from all of the sources of knowledge that we have available to us. And that's one reason I'm kind of excited about meeting the Unitarians in this General Assembly and the new people here, because of the many uh, faith institutions the Unitarians, I think, are the most positioned and oriented toward exploring these deepest questions within an institutional frame. Now, all of this, of course, moves us in the direction of rethinking our economies at the most foundational level. And here is what I see emerging as what I call the sacred life and living earth story, the counter the sacred money and market story. Essentially, it is almost the exact opposite of every point of the sacred money and market story. So we start out, time is life. Real wealth is living wealth. Money is just a number. It's useful as a medium of exchange in a well-regulated market, but that's all. We humans are living beings. We are born of and nurtured by a living earth, itself born of a living universe. Here's a key. Life exists only in the community within which life self-organizes to maintain the conditions essential to life. There is, you know, from, the, from that absurdity that there is no community to the deeper reality that there is no life without community. We are a part of nature, not apart from nature. Earth does not belong to us, we belong to Earth. A living superorganism that self-organizes to maintain the conditions essential to the existence of all life. Our health and well-being depend on her health and well-being. Our human nature calls us to care and share for the benefit of all. Serving the living community that sustains us is essential to community health and the source of our greatest happiness. Individual, individualistic greed, ruthless competition, and violence against life. These are not our nature. To the contrary, these are indicators of serious psychological and societal dysfunction. They are in fact the characteristics of the psychopath. Poverty is most often the consequence of a lack of opportunity. The only, the only legitimate purpose of any human institution, whether business, government, or civil society, is to support people as productive, contributing, sharing members of a vibrant and prosperous living earth community. Corporations are engines of wealth concentration that have an inherent tendency to undermine democracy and essential feedback mechanisms. In other words, they undermine both democracy and markets. The corporations that seek to monopolize the resources in the pursuit of purely financial ends have no place in a healthy human society. Well, this begins to give us a frame for rebuilding society, building on rebuilding community, rebuilding local economies that exist and function within communities and community norms. Learning to organize as nature organizes around bioregions that are fundamentally self-reliant in terms of meeting their own needs within their own resources. And we could go further with the discussion of the organizational dynamics, the system dynamics, and so forth that are essential to this process. The, the intricate adaptation that is required for living communities to maximize their, their generative potential, their capacity to support and maintain themselves. Uh, that the decision making everywhere is local. So you begin to see the frame for an economy that is in every element the exact opposite of the global economy that we are evolving and an economy that operates by the rules that our unfortunate president and his corporate colleagues in Congress are 
advancing through these new corporate rights agreements from the TPP and the other uh, the other agreements that are now uh, now beginning to come before Congress. So um, this is kind of the context of our work. I've gone a little longer than I intended for the. Uh, Thank you.